such a great honor to be here at such an important uh, event, conference, all of you doing such great work. I'm in awe of all of you. Uh, my name is Christine Brennan. I'm USA Today's national sports columnist. I'm a commentator on ABC News, CNN, CBS. <laughs> Got some ABC people? Wow. Oh, the, okay. Maybe you're cheering the Washington Capitals, right? Yes. Or the, uh, the uh, upcoming US Wim Women's World Cup uh, in Canada, which there, that's very cool. Um, and uh, so I work for ABC and CNN, PBS, and NPR, Alphabet Soup. <laughs> and I'm a, an author of seven books. And I think one of the, um, the really intriguing things for me being here with you and learning from you is that I've covered the last 16 Olympics in a row, winter and summer, going back to LA in 84. And um, I often uh, deal with these issues when they bubble to the surface at, on the sports level and at the Olympic level internationally involving women. As you may know, the London Olympics was the first where every nation did bring at least one female athlete, which was a huge advancement, well, well past its time, but nonetheless something that was wonderful to, to achieve. And before I introduce this amazing panel, I just want to say a big thanks to my friend Layla Milani. Layla, thank you for putting all this together. And one of, I've got to give a shout out to one of my favorite athletes, Sanam. Sanam, I love watching you play. And uh, Sanam played soccer for, for several years with my niece. So we spent a lot of time on those soccer fields, didn't we? And swimming, too. Yes, it's great to see you. We're going to keep an eye on you, maybe an Olympics someday for you, kiddo. Um, anyway, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, this fantastic panel. I'm just going to give a sentence or two bio. I believe all the bios are in the program, is that correct? So you can read up on these fantastic people, but I wanna, we want to be able to get to you and not, um, not spend any more time. Uh, first, Yvonne Akoth, is, am I pronouncing that correctly? Thank you. Is a post-2015 ambassador of the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts and chair of the Pan-African Youth Leadership Network of the United Nations for the implementation of the MDG's Kenyan chapter. Yvonne Akoth. Next, we have Willington Sakade. All right, uh, is program manager for the Good School Program uh, at Raising Voices Kampala, Uganda. He works daily with a wide range of stakeholders engaged in, performing, in transforming children's experiences of school, including young boys and girls, teachers, parents, and policymakers. Willington, nice to see you. <laughs> Next to Willington, we have Ravi Verma. Ravi is the Regional Director for the International Center for Research on Women's Asia Regional Office in New Delhi, India. In this role, uh, Ravi leads that uh, local and inter regional efforts to conduct research and provide technical support uh, and do many other things for economic development for engaging men and boys in gender-based violence. Ravi, nice to see you. <laughs> Last but far from least, Nora uh, Files. Mm -hmm. Nora is a head of the Secretariat for the United Nations Girls' Education Initiative, a multi-stakeholder partnership committed to improving the quality and availability of girls' education and contributing to the empowerment of girls and women through transformative education. Nora Files. And now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, a film. I understand we're gonna have that now. I'd like to join the conversation. I want to talk about my right to be respected. I want to be heard. And I want to listen. Girls in every country across the world are being subjected to many forms of violence. This is wrong and must stop. Girls have the right to live free from violence and the fear of violence. They need to be aware of their rights and find the voice to create global movement and actions to end the violence. I want to be part of this conversation. I believe every girl has a right to feel safe. I want to end the silence. I 
am going to shout about my right to be valued. We're starting to shout! Building from a whisper to a shout, we need to talk. Join together and inspire action around the world. The World Association of Girl Guys and Girl Scouts is running a campaign to stop the violence. We're building a global movement of people who believe that violence against girls is an injustice that we stayed silent for too long. We're going to launch a non-formal education curriculum on ending violence. Most importantly, we're going to speak out for girls' rights and we're asking you to join the conversation. Every girl has the right to live free from violence or the fear of violence. So, let's take action and let it change. Ignoring violence against girls or pretending that it's not there is the same as accepting it. Add your voice. Avon, please. Um, thank you so much. Let me just uh, talk a bit about the video. The video, um, Stop the Violence, Speak Out for Girls' Rights, is a video that was produced by the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts as part of a campaign that focuses on ending violence against girls and young women from all over the world. The main aim of the video is to strengthen, empower, and give the girls courage and commitment to be able to speak out against violence, not only in their lives, but in the lives of others. Thank you. Well, if, I, I believe we're going to put you on the spot for a couple minutes. Is that okay? Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, do you want to come back down and sit here? Okay. okay. Oh, excuse me. Maybe you can describe for everyone what violence against girls and women does look like in Kenya, um, and why do you think taking part in Voices Against Violence is important to girls in Kenya? Okay. Um, taking part, girls... Uh, Taking part in violence prevention in Kenya is very important because first and foremost, violence is unfortunately on the increase. And it is something that has continued over time with little action from girls and young women specifically who are the main victims. It's, the Voices Against Violence curriculum is, uh, is a good curriculum for girls and young women because it gives them the opportunity to start a conversation about violence and enable them to, to be able to gain knowledge and information that will enable them to confidently say what are some of the challenges they face. But after girls and young women have gone through the curriculum, they're able to gain a lot of knowledge and learning outcomes that focus on gender equality, identifying violence, developing respectful relationships, speaking out and taking action against violence. But most importantly, they will be confident enough to speak out against violence. You mentioned that violence is increasing. And this might sound like a, I don't want to say dumb question, but I'm, I'm just curious, why is it increasing? With, especially as we're, you're empowering these young women, you're doing more. Is it a backlash against that? Why, why is there more violence as opposed to less violence in 2015? Okay, sadly enough, uh, violence in Kenya is, violence against girls and young women in Kenya is uh, promoted by a lot of social, cultural, and even political issues. And when we address issues of violence, we've never actually thought of bringing girls to be part of the conversation. So when it happens to them, most of the time they don't report it. This creates a, a, an environment for it to, to grow. And of course, when they don't report it, little action is taken. So the curriculum gives them an opportunity to be able to recognize violence in the first place, to be able to understand what violence is. And in the process, they get to learn about their human rights. So for violence to be on the increase, it means a lot of people sometimes, especially children, girls and young women, don't know that they're experiencing violence. And those who, those who know don't report it. Yeah. Is this mostly violence with um, people they know, or is it people, or is it strangers? Uh, most of the violence is with people they know, people in their homes, people in the community, people in schools. It could be their teachers, it could be their friends. And last question for you, 
Can you talk to us a little bit about your own experience and what impact the program had on you and, and your community? Um, as a young woman who was uh, working and living in an informal settlement, that is after high school, I got the opportunity to volunteer in a lot of community-based uh, projects. And uh, during that time, I noticed a few of my friends had actually undergone a lot of sexual abuse, especially rape. And in the process, they contracted HIV. So I never started working on gender-based violence. At that particular time, I was actually focused on HIV and AIDS prevention because it has diverse big effects, especially in the lives of girls and young women. So I realized that, oh, fine, HIV and AIDS is already a big issue in the community. But before I can address HIV and AIDS or continue advocating against it or promoting prevention, I should first start focusing on gender-based violence prevention. So after joining the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts, which I joined as an adult after high school, I was able to be capacity built through non-formal education that widened my scope about gender-based violence issues. So that is how I got interested to work on violence prevention. Thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Yvonne. Yes, thank you. Willington, I'd like to invite you up to the podium to speak with us a little bit about raising voices in Uganda. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk. I've been doing this work for the past eight years, but I do it now with more passion. Because where I come from, uh, by the time you make 35 years and you don't have a child, you're looked at as someone who is not man enough. So for so many years, I had not been man enough in my community. And last year, I was blessed with a baby girl. So now I got to know that I have to advocate more even for my girl. And I'm not doing so badly in my community. I'm actually expecting a second one after just one. <laughs> and when I did the scan before coming here, I found out that it's another baby girl. So I come from an organization called Raising Voices I'm from Uganda. I don't take it for granted that lots of people know about Uganda. We are from East Africa, neighboring Kenya. And my organization works to prevent violence against women and children. Uh, Mary will uh, share with you a lot around our SASA intervention. But the new package we have now is called the Good School Toolkit. And this is an innovation that comes from eight years of working with schools to try to prevent the issue of violence against children. And where I come from, there are high rates of violence against boys and girls, especially around physical violence and sexual violence. Physical violence being experienced more by boys and sexual violence being experienced more by, uh, I mean, physical by boys and sexual by girls. And the Good School Toolkit focuses on transforming the operational culture of schools to be responsive to children's needs. Because if you look at the investments we've had in Uganda over the past years, it has been more of putting up structures, more of concentrating on the school curriculum, the formal curriculum, and putting up you know, scholastic materials, but not the experience of what children find when they get to school. Now, um, this toolkit um, is an experience of those schools in Uganda, and mainly coming from studies that we've conducted widely around what it takes to prevent violence against women and, 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 and girls as well as children. Now, the stake of Ugandan education is so challenging. If you could move to the next slide. Um, if you look at um, 1997, we introduced universal free primary education. And we had over 2 million children joining. 1 million were girls. And our education system takes over seven years. But in five years along the way, out of the one million, we were only remaining with 400 girls. And by seven years, at completion of the cycle, we only had 220,000 um, 220, children still in school. And when we looked at um, the factors that bring up about that undesired situation, many of the children said, 46% of those who dropped out said that they were experiencing physical and sexual violence. And school was not a safe place for them to be. Now, we, um, uh, we collaborated with the Ministry of Education in Uganda and other partners, UNICEF, uh, Save the Children, in terms of how do you address that issue? And every time you find civil societies working in developing countries, it's more of the money. 
It's more of the projects that you take in there that start and end. But it was not about progressive attitude change. This we realized that when you look at these communities, it was more of opening, opening up discussions and dialogues between teachers, children, and parents in terms of how do you transform this situation into a desirable learning environment. Can you go to the next slide? Now, many of the things that we are now doing are focusing around creating good schools, schools that are gender equitable, schools that teach children that what is good for boys is good for girls, schools that teach them that what girls can be part of, boys can also be part of, and they live in the same community. Just recently, you know, we have this 1,000 schools project that is being funded by the Girls Education Challenge. And recently we had a child who, I mean, a group of children who went and stopped a marriage that was supposed to, to, um, that was supposed to take place on that very day. And children and their head teachers interrupted and intercepted it. And when they reported back, we were so amazed with that because they were talking about marginalization that was happening in their community. And they were saying, we can't see this continuing. This 14-year child is not going to be married off when we have messages that are saying that girls should be at school. And that was a big plus for us. Next slide, quickly. So we are also aiming at bringing on board parents to reimagine a new school, schools that are conducive for learning, schools that are cathedrals of learning. And then they bring out these ideas, enabling children to share with each other. We are realizing that children can be agents of change themselves. If they have um, access to um, problem-solving um, skills that could be equipped with them, and they are not just focusing on passing exams, but also being able to make choices, having voices, and having activities that allow them to express themselves. So we have a wide range of activities that we are suggesting in that toolkit. It's at the back there. Please feel free to pick a copy. We are experimenting that in 1,000 schools in Uganda at the moment. We started with only seven schools. Now we have 1,000. And then we also have 800 schools in Switzerland that are joining. And we have just completed this randomized control trial with the London School of um, Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And it indicated that toolkit is effective at reducing physical violence by 40% over the past week. So it's a big success. And I would, like to take this, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Hewlett Foundation. It's the one that funded that study. And then Well Spring is also coming on board. We would like to take this intervention to scale. If I had several minutes, I would give all the details about the toolkit. But in five minutes, to someone who talks a lot like me, there's too little that you can share. But I'm sure we will be interacting. And yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you, Wellington. That was fantastic. I think you covered it better than you think you did. So bravo on that. Now I believe we are going to see a, uh, the, the film clip, Boys Do Not Do Housework. Is that correct? Got that next. My name is Tinti Dhananjay Gupta. I live in Chita Camp Trombe. I live in Chita Camp Trombe. My age is 15. I like dancing, singing, studying. I like it all. My name is Sheikh Mousi. I live in Chita Camp Trombe. I like it all. 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 I help my mom to make food, to make clothes, to make clothes. My mom has to make clothes, to make clothes, to make clothes, to make clothes, to make clothes. Hi, Hello. 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 प्रॉब्लम यहाँ से और यहाँ पे बहुत सारी गर्ल्स हैं जो अभी ये बोल रहे हैं ना घर में कोई किसी की मत नहीं बोलनी बोलेंगे नहीं पेरेंट्स के सामने और पेरेंट्स एक आध पेरेंट्स अगर सुन भी ले ठीक है चलो बेटा बोल दिया यहाँ से सुना ऐसे निकाल दिया बात करना और ये बॉयज ये बोल रहे हैं ना अभी हम काम करते हैं ये करते 
लड़की लोगों को करने दो कहाँ जा स्कूल स्कूल जा बोले जा जब से तू घर में पढ़ा है बोले तो मैं कर तो जा खाली बर्तन ना कपड़ा छोड़ के सब कर दो यहाँ तक मत बर्तन ना कपड़ा नहीं दो बाकी पोछा मार दो अडीचा जिसको देखने अडीचा देखो यहाँ से जाता हूँ अडीचा घर पे साथ बेरा मैं अपनी दुकान खोल के मैं खुद पोछा मारता हूँ सर तो हम लोग घर घर में जाके बोल रहे थे मम्मी ने सर लोग ने ये बोला कि औरत आदमी के बराबर होती है काम करना चाहिए ये करना चाहिए तो मेरी मम्मी बोले लगता तू ना शादी के बाद औरत का गुलाम ही बन जाएगा चेंज क्या चेंज होगा तभी जब पेरेंट्स समझेंगे लोगों की मेंटालिटी चेंज होगी और हम खुद के अंदर पहले चेंज करें बोलने का इच्छा रखें मैं गया हूँ अभी मेरी शादी हुई तो अगर मैं इसको बदलूँगा तो जो मेरे बच्चे होंगे वो भी इसको बदलते चले जाएंगे फिर वहीं से वो पीढ़ी लड़का लड़की में भेदभाव करना बंद कर देगी थैंक यू वेरी मच आई एम डीपली ऑनर टू बी हियर and i thank uh, thank you all for uh, inviting me the gems program to be represented here i bring you greetings from icrw we are very proud of the program that has evolved painstakingly over several years uh, it began with the uh, with the idea of challenging the notions of masculinity and the manhood as they are shaped and and enacted within the schools as an institution so many of us believe that schools are the places where Uh, you know they just learn skills and move ahead in lives the children uh, but the fact is that schools are the ones that mirror the stereotypes and the uh, and the norms of the so society and they in fact uh, up uphold them in in ways that are not often very subtle uh, you know lots of uh, work around gems that we have done in many different settings uh, tells us the same story uh one of our recent work in in jharkhand which is uh, you know the gems we are implementing in two two large districts uh the baseline information uh showed that 68% of boys and about 55 53 to 55% of girls said that they have experienced violence from teachers uh, and in fact the peer violence was second to the violence that they experienced from teachers uh and and the teachers uh, don't recognize those violence Uh, because they think that instilling fear is the integral part of disciplining children and and the manner in which the violence is normalized in the school system is an amazing experience to watch and see a uh, lot of people just don't recognize that how boys and girls are uh, socialized within the school system uh, into different boxes uh, i i just uh, i have many quotes where you know in our study um, where the boys tell us that who are the types of girls who deserve harassment or who are raped if the girls don't walk with the heads bowed down or if the girl uh, talks to the boys if the girls wear short dresses so you hear all those kinds of justifications that we have heard from the adults in later life uh, coming from the voices of children within the schools so while the boys experience more boys experiences experience violence uh, the girls experience a sense of fear and a sense of unsafe a safe you know a sense where they are not safe and the consequences of this kind of very often uh, uh, the violence is that a lot of girls about 50% of the girls in our program they said that they want to drop out of the schools uh, or they don't like this particular school they would like to change the schools and not only girls even boys because a lot of boys also uh don't uh, don't appreciate or they don't like the violence that happens to them because they think that th th because they don't accept it but they don't talk because this is is part of the growing up this is how the boys have to grow up and and become tough men and there is no reporting there is no recording and there is no response system in the schools our schools are just not prepared to accept violence as a part of the education system so none of the schools whether it is vietnam or india or bangladesh we are very happy dfid is supporting us in a big way to generate the uh, regional evidence on how a standardized program can impact and reduce violence across different settings uh, so uh, we, we have seen that the um, uh, the boys and girls they experience violence uh, in the schools 
they don't talk about it because schools, whom do they talk to? Schools are not prepared. If they go to teachers, teachers' own attitudes and their own response mechanism is such that it pushes the children back. If they go to the parents, parents say that you just focus on studies. Uh, so that there is no, there's no one who's listening to them. Now, it is this backdrop, and this is the assumption that we, uh, we had when we began working on the, on the program called Gender Equity Movement in school, Schools. We began first by, by experimenting it in 45 schools in Maharashtra and Mumbai. Uh, after a successful you know, randomized control trial, we, uh, we demonstrated the usefulness of this, this approach. And then the municipal corporation of Mumbai scaled it up to 750 schools. Then the Vietnam, Da Nang province showed interest. We went there, we impl implemented, and now we are implementing it in, with many partners in, uh, in, uh, in Bangladesh. The unique feature of, of the GEMS program is that it, it, coach, it, help, it is a transformative program. So it not only helps to transform the individual attitudes and behaviors, it does not only work with the children in a structured manner, it also works with the school as a system. So we, we, uh, uh, what we do is when schools come on board with authorities, they start uh, changing, they first start questioning the practices that segregate the genders. They start questioning and introspecting about all those uh, school-based norms uh, that are directly or indirectly responsible in perpetuating those, uh, those divisions. So we, we try and change those practices at the institutional level. We work with teachers to change their own ideas of disciplining and knowledge sharing. So this is very important how teachers interact with children in order to make sure that the knowledge is a participatory engaging process rather than top down. We work with the, uh, with the, with the, with the parents to make sure that they are on board. On, and then we work with the, C, the civil society organizations, we work with the school authorities beyond the school system. We work especially with the school management committee, which is the parents teachers committee, which makes sure that these discussions happen there. So uh, the GEMS program therefore not only is uh, a very content focused, you know, in terms of uh, making sure that these different constituencies find focus time to discuss introspect and, crit and do critical thinking on these issues, but also are supported by the larger environment within which these discussions happen, and there is a support system. So as a next step in GEMS, what we are doing is trying to create, uh, all, we have created a lot of manuals and handbooks on, on how to train teachers on GEMS and what to do within the classroom. There are 21 sessions that we have, we have worked and, and, and developed in partnership with children, but also how to respond to violence. In this school, I think teachers need skills to to address violence. The school system needs skill. Besides, most schools would say that have counselors, and that will it is like passing the buck. The teachers continue to do their own practices, and the counselors will address the the issue of violence as a mental health issue, which we are trying to challenge. It's not a mental health issue. It's a it's a it's a normative issue, and the norms need to change, and therefore. While you have a few ex extreme forms of violence and bullies that you address through those mechanisms, we need to find a mainstream approach to, to change the ideas of, uh, of segregating boys and girls and, and creating subtle forms of violent uh, spaces in the schools. Well, we think that this is, this is uh, only by mainstreaming the discourses on violence within the education system, we can really create a new generation, whether it is from Mumbai or it is Manila. Thank you very much. I think I'll be happy to. And uh, now we have Nora. And as I understand, Nora, do you have a presentation, or do you just want to do a little Q&A? Mm -hmm. well, there you go. I, we can do that. <laughs> um, sorry for talking over all the rest of you, although please feel free to chime in at any moment, I think. Uh, uh, Nora, what we've heard here, it, it, one question hit me, and this will not shock you because obviously I'm a sports journalist, but every single story we've heard, an anecdote we've heard so far, I'm thinking if sports is a part of these girls' lives, how could it change? We know what's happened in the United States with Title IX, most important law in our country, I believe, over the last 45 years, and we will just start to see the crest of the tidal wave of Title IX in the next 20 to 30 years. We are just beginning now, 20 women in the US Senate, obviously a woman running for president who was pre-Title IX, 
but we haven't even thought about what those next 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years are going to look like with women running for president. Every time on all tickets, uh, all of them will have played sports because of Title IX. That's our wonderful country of the United States with all the riches we have. Could you maybe speak, or any of you speak, to what sports can mean to empower these young girls, and what more can we all do to get sports into these girls' lives? Any thoughts on that? Great, I'm not really well positioned to talk about sport. But what about the activity? <laughs> I mean, the, the whole idea of allowing girls to express themselves through any kind of modality, sport is one enormously important one. They learn to, they learn to have confidence and to act f based on their own interests. They, they, work to, they learn to work together, to be right up there, and to make the goal. It's a very powerful process, and we know that sport is great for, for girls. And it actually works really well parallel to girls in school. It actually dem has been demonstrated to develop and, and strengthen their academic uh, progress as well because they learn to lean in, to step out, and to speak up. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the program that uh, the uh, Global Partners Working Group on School Related Gender Based Violence, that was just launched, launched a year ago, is that correct? That's right. So, how's it going so far? <laughs> I want to talk about this because um, although I can't see you with the lights, I know there are an awful lot of my friends in this community or people who, with whom I work, we work through your organizations. Um, working in school-related gender-based violence is a fairly new area of work for educators. It is not new for the gender community. From, it was in the part, a big part of the Beijing platform. It, was, it has been a part of the conversation of the, our gender colleagues for a long time. Educators have not come to this until quite recently. And it's maybe about the last five years. And some of the leaders are in this room. DFID a very large, played a very large role in opening the space to discuss school-related gender-based violence, USAID as well. Well, what I discovered in the last, um, the last two years since I've taken on this position of, of managing or supporting the management of a global partnership is that organizations tend to work alone for a while until they come close enough to each other to realize that if they don't start to talk to each other, we're all going to be doing the same thing or we're going to be missing opportunities to make a big difference together. Last year, I started to bring together organizations whom I knew were already working here. ICRW, represented through other organizations, civil society actors, the big ones such as PLAN, SAVE, um, FAWE, some of the large investors in this work, DFID, of course, USAID was there. Uh, also France, who has not stepped up in terms of education investment, but has a huge commitment to address gender-based violence. Some of the UN actors, UNICEF, UNF, uh, UN, uh, UN Women, we came together and said, oh my goodness, look at that. We have all this work we have been doing in research and in programming, but we do not work together. We don't even know what each other are doing. So we decided this was a prime opportunity, opportunity 2013, just about time to wake up and say, okay, 2014, sorry, and to form a group it would be able to do better research together, better advocacy together, and to develop a global guidance that would build on the work of DFID that Baroness spoke to before, and other, other demonstrations of what actually works, um, and to make those available. The one thing that Ungai provided in this working, through this working group is access to all this documentation on the Ungai website. So we have, the, we have this material. We don't have the good school product yet. <laughs> Not yet, but we will. So there's a go-to place to pick up this material. Um, and in, when we can, we have this translated into French so that we open up the dialogue between what tends to be quite a separate community in the, in the Francophone area and in the Anglophone area of the world. And real quickly, we just have another moment or so. Uh, for this part of our conversation, uh, teachers are obviously among the most important actors uh, playing a role in school-related uh, gender-based violence. Can you tell us about the plans? Absolutely. For We've heard about it here, and everyone talks about the role of teachers in this, in this discussion. Wearing my other hat as managing the UN Girls' Education Initiative, I started a conversation with Education International a couple of years ago. 
because I recognize that network has a great reach. It speaks for 30 million teachers, and it has an engagement internally about what works, what's appropriate, what's good practice in schools. So I said, OK, maybe we could have a conversation how we might support them. And now together, we have a, we have a program. On, I'm just checking the title here because it's changed a bit. It's called Teacher Unions Take Action to Eliminate School-Related Gender-Based Violence. And it's run by the union itself. Right now, the pilot phase includes seven unions in five countries. And they are building up the unionists, mostly women unionists, to work with their male counterparts and to introduce an opportunity to make change through schools in those countries. I would, if I can take one second, I wanted to demonstrate or speak to the demonstration of what works when you work together. The 30 plus organizations in the working group on school related gender based violence supported France to last week finally put, a, put to the executive board of the UNESCO a resolution that UNESCO and all the member states in UNESCO would stand up and speak out on the elimination of school-related gender-based violence. And that was passed unanimously, unanimously last week. And we're hoping that that might come eventually to the General Assembly. So we will have, we hope, eventually, a resolution which is, which is owned by all countries to speak out against school-related gender-based violence. And we're very excited about that. Wonderful, Nora. Thank you. Thanks for those great words. Uh, do we have time for a few questions? We do. Okay. I assume we, yes, ma'am, right here. I think we have a couple microphones. Why don't we wait till the mic gets to you just so that everyone can hear? And we are getting can there. Good morning. My name is Marzia. I'm working with the Feminist Majority Foundation. I was born and raised in Afghanistan, and I couldn't go to school for six years because of the Taliban. My question is, what's the role of government um, in um, mm -hmm. violence, especially in Uganda and Kenya? Because in Afghanistan, girls face a lot of problems, of course, uh, mostly because of uh, safety and security and violence and tradition. Mm -hmm. And many parents, they are upset with the government for not uh, taking action and taking it serious. When girls get raped, you know, they don't, uh, take it as serious as they should to punish the rapist. Thank you. Um, I'll talk on behalf of uh, the Ugandan government. Um, one of the things that government is encouraging is, of course, taking girls to school. And when you look at um, the universal free primary education policy, it insists that every family must take at least two girls to school. However, the challenge that we are also experiencing is the fact that even when government has these policies in place, there should be support from the community members themselves. These girls are not targeted and um, you know, we can only work with them when they are at school. While this has been opened up, we are finding out that over 15% of the girls across the country are out of school. They are eligible to be in school, it's free, but parents are not taking them there. Why? Because they have different aspirations for boys and girls. They think that girls are meant for marriage, that even when they go to school, they should just learn basic skills like reading and counting to become better wives. So what we are trying to say is that, you know, it's, um, it's a good intervention to link both schools and communities because schools do not exist in isolation. We can improve the quality of schools but if the homes where they are coming from and the communities are not paying attention to the needs of girls, definitely we are not going to succeed. Okay, yes. Um, let me give an example with the Kenyan situation. For us, we have, like Uganda, we have excellent policies and laws on eradicating gender-based violence and uh, promoting education. For gender-based violence alone, we have more than 40 laws. So for us, it's not an issue because even the president uh, supports, thing, supports initiatives that end gender-based violence. Like a few months ago, young women were being raped or girls were wearing very short clothes. But the president stood out and said it is her right to wear what she wants because that's her space. 
But for us, we are trying to approach it from a different angle, whereby we are trying to empower the girls themselves with the knowledge and the information that you need to go to school and this is important for you because of one, two, three, and four. We realize that once girls have the knowledge and the, the information, they talk to their parents and they talk to their teachers, or even some go to the extent of going to their community leaders who help them push their agenda. And while we go to the next question, I know, Ravi, you wanted to add a little something about sports. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, uh, mention about the work that Future Without Violence and ICAW did in, uh, you know, about five years back, which was adaptation of coaching boys into men uh, in India called Parivartan, which was uh, taking the mentor. It, th that program was all about challenging the masculinity norms how it plays out within the sports field. It worked exclusively with the boys in these poor communities, some communities. Uh, and it was, um, and it has, Esther, you are here, I'm so happy that this program has moved to the next generation where the same boy, the boys who, were, who, who participated in this uh, transformative programs are helping to set up a girls sports program in the same communities. And, uh, and it's a largely 85% Muslim community and girls of 12 to 16 years uh, who are never allowed to go outside the uh, home and have dropped out of the schools come and play kabaddi. Kabaddi is a sports which is a, a girls wrestling, very South Asian sports where girls, you know, uh, they, 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 a team of six each, they wrestle out with each other and it's, it's one of the Asian games also. And, and in the last eight months, this Parvartan program has led to some of these girls who never, never went out of the house to be selected for the Mumbai team. And uh, they, are, uh, they are going ahead with, with this kind of, and the boys, uh, and the critical uh, aspect of this is that the, it is a consequence, it's a sequence of the Parvartan program that happened with boys in the early. So it's a boys moving into the spaces of girls and working together to create a gender equitable community. I think sports is a very powerful medium, very powerful platform. That's wonderful. Thank you for that, yes. Question, and this should be our last question. Of course. Good morning, Jill Christensen, National Education Association. It's wonderful to be here. Absolutely, boys and men are a part of this equation in order to resolve things. I want to say appreciation for UNGAI and the work with Education International in Southern Africa. Clearly, educators are a part of the solution, maybe part of the problem too. And so really it would be very interesting to hear from the panelists as to in fact how you're working with the spokespeople for educators and that is teachers unions, education unions. On our part actually next week I'll be in a meeting with education unions from across Latin America, every country on gender issues and where we stand in schools. It's continuing work that we do and there's a really very big international awareness amongst educators as far as school-based gender violence and what we can do. Thank you. Laura, well, you want to start? We'll um, I have spoken about this. I think this is a really important thing that we do, is to engage with teachers. They, and Ravi said it already. The school is a mirror of society. So pointing fingers at teachers rather than pointing fingers at anybody else is really not helpful to us. However, they are with children for an extended period of time, and therefore children are at risk. Society also demonstrates, and Ravi, you talked about that, the, our, expect, our expectation that teachers will play, are in a position of power and authority, and therefore they have the right to act this out against children. Now, when you throw gender into the mix, we're going to have problems. How we work with teachers is really important. I think this starts to answer the question that was raised by our colleague from, Uga from, from Afghanistan also, is that, how the ministry has expectations about the role of teachers in the classroom. I think the whole work we do with teachers is critically important to support them to step out and take on a new role, to see themselves differently and to act responsibly and to establish also accountability mechanisms to support them to behave well through the accountability which, they, which is going to protect both the students and the children, uh, sorry, students and the teachers. Others might want to talk about that. Anyone else want to? I totally agree with you on that. And I think one of the things that, um, that, um, that we are also increasingly noticing is that every time we have teachers on board and they have meaningful relationships with their learners, the results have always been encouraging. 
ministries of, uh, ministries of education are so good at passing the policies, but on a day-to-day -day basis, teachers also struggle with loads of other things when they're dealing with children. One of the lessons that we are also learning is that this work should not be, and, and this movement should not be portrayed as if it's additional work for teachers, but it's part of day-to-day -day negotiations, part of day-to-day -day discussions, and opening up spaces to talk about gender-based violence, not an additional piece of work that they are supposed to be doing. So what we are realizing is that we are moving away from the old traditional way of as if we are implementing projects where you give teachers activities, but instead equipping them with ideas and messages that address gender-based violence. Please thank this wonderful panel.